Good evening, my name is Claire and I'm an alcoholic. And I'm grateful to be sober and a proud member of the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'd like to thank Mag and the, and the committee for the honor and the privilege to be asked to come and share my experience, strength, and hope with you, which is always a privilege to participate in any meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, she, she and Susie picked me up at the airport yesterday, and, and when I got that call, they usually call us sometimes ahead of their uh, conferences, and, and they told me it was a um, singles conference, and I've been doing this for a lot of years, but I'd never been to a singles conference, and I said, I'll come just to put my name on the list, you know? <laughs> <laughs> And uh, and uh, we just you know get that opportunity and hop on. I call the big birds and um, and we show up in the airports and you know we don't carry big books under our arms or we, you know it's just like a, you know we just kind of have that that, that 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 eye contact and when I you know got in the airport uh, and they said there was, there was a car- carousel um, a B8 I think. And of course now with everything so modern, I whip out my cell phone because I, I don't see um, Maggie and she's over at B7. So she said, oh, I'll come right over. So here they come trucking over there and we get in the car and we, we have a, you know, a meeting as we always do, you know, on our way here. And it's always, you know, again, I walk into these rooms and thank you for your hospitality. And it's been a wonderful, wonderful weekend. And, and I look at your smiling faces, and I know one more time I'm standing in the sunlight of the spirit. Yes. Alcoholics Anonymous. And I, I'm so glad to be here. And congratulations to the chip takers. And wasn't, wasn't that countdown awesome, you know? And I just love that moment and seeing them sit and stand and all these years of sobriety in this room. And, and uh, when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, I was a uh, full-blown winette. <laughs> in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, which is the basic text of our program, um, in Chapter 3, More About Alcoholism, it explains the insane things that we sometimes continue to do to keep from doing Step 1, 2, and 3. And in that list of insanes is one of them said we switched to natural wines. Man, I had switched to Ripple. <laughs> And that is not one of your natural wines. <laughs> I don't think a single grape, a single grape was ever near that stuff. <laughs> I, I don't know what they put in it, but, you know, by the time uh, I got to the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous, I was literally doing a dance with death. And it was still in the paper bag. And I ended up in, in South Central Los Angeles doing that dance. I come from the jazz world, Boston, New York, Harlem, and Los Angeles, and L.A. And, and I know about the dance, and I know when the music stops. And I tell you that um, the music had stopped, and I was still trying to make it work again. And I was, had gotten to that place where alcohol simply didn't work for me anymore. But I had to lose a lot of things before I got down there. And um, we tell our story in a general way, what it used to be like, what happened, and what it's like now. And um, I had lost it all, thank you, God. I, I never thought I'd stand in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and say, thank you that you took away from me everything I wanted in order to give me what I needed. Came that time in my life when I needed to stop drinking. I needed to find a God of my understanding, and I simply need to stop dying. And after 24 years in a marriage, and my ex-husband and I drank, uh, uh, drank for drink for all those years, and we ended up, and I had long since crossed that invisible line that we talk about, and I'm standing outside of a house in Los Angeles that we had had uh, some success in a, in a business, in a maintenance business, property management maintenance business, and my oldest son, who was born in Boston, and I'll tell you that story, uh, who was uh, 18 at the time, and my two younger children were born in Los Angeles. And um, I, I, I was standing outside the house, 
and watching the marshal put the lock on the door in my beautiful home and all those outside things that were supposed to make me fit and be somebody. And I watched the uh, internal revenue, you know, shut me down. And I came in here owing thousands of dollars in payroll taxes and on and on and on. And the part of the second step of my total insanity. And by this time, in, I'm in, in violent behavior. And I'm and that husband's gone because we were doing we were doing a, a dueling dance with with, with 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 weapons by this time, and I was totally out of control. And that the second half of the first step in my life was totally unmanageable. I had no idea that alcohol had anything to do with this. It was always people, places, and things. If they get off my back, you know, everything would get better. Um, was standing outside the house, he was gone because he said, you know, if I stay, you will either kill me or I'll kill you. It's time to go. And I'm standing outside the house, and that 18-year-old son was standing there and look at me with that look. I don't know if you've had them look at you with that look. And, 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 and of an 18-year-old son with tears in his eyes, and they just didn't run. I guess it wasn't macho for an 18-year-old young man to to cry over a drunken mother, you know, who was beginning to wake up for strang with strangers for the price of a drink. And he looked at me and he said, I don't know who you are. You've never been there for us. That youngest son was, I think, about 12 at the time, and my little daughter was 8. And they'd never, you know, been, lived under these conditions, and they were frightened, and I could look and see their fear, and I could feel that pain, but I didn't know what else to say to them. Uh, but I looked at him and said, and screw you too, in the arrogance of the, of the alcoholic. But what I couldn't tell that young son is, but you don't understand. You know, when I take a drink, the drink takes me, and then I give it to power, because I can't stop drinking. But instead, I said, you know, yeah, screw you. I had a blue sheet of paper with all my, all the, all my fair weather friends, as Bill Wilson, the co-founder of our program, and I believe that this program was divinely inspired. And, and he talks about his fair weather friends, and they were all gone, and my wonderful family, and my brothers and sisters who had all been very successful in their careers, and, and they, they were living in Los Angeles at the time, and they had kissed me goodbye. And I am standing out on that sidewalk with a little piece of paper and a name on it and an address. And I didn't know where this place was, but I called a cab. And I, and I ended up, and it was in the ghetto, South Central Los Angeles, and the dance really started. I walked into that house, and I drew the drapes. And I'm sure I was doomed to die of this disease. I put on my drinking robe, which was a white terry cloth robe with wine stains on it. And I was wearing this bright red wig <laughs> that had bangs. <laughs> and I used to get drunk and trim the bangs. That older son said he wouldn't go, so he left. He left us, you know, he just left us standing out in front of that house, and he was gone. So I had the two younger ones. And I would come out of the black house. I'm a real alcoholic. The kind is described in the book. And by this time, I'm in horrendous blackouts most of the time. And I'd come to out of blackouts around, you know, 10, 11 o'clock at night, and my heart would be pounding like a drum. It was pounding not from excitement and living on the edge, and I'll tell you about what it was like living on the edge for many years. It, it was from fear, and I was terrified that I was going to die. That had been always at the top of my list. You know, from the time I was five years old, I was always afraid of death. And I knew that the only thing that would resolve that was to get out of that house and get over to the nearest sleazy bar uh, in, in, the, in that area, in that neighborhood. There's about six liquor stores and within a radius of two blocks and, uh, and, and then all these sleazy bars in between and so I don't know about you guys but I was I loved those bars and I loved that music and I loved that empty laughter and I always uh, crawled up on the stool at the end of the bar and what, looking in that mirror I don't know how many of you, about you ladies but um, I met a lot of out of work 
commercial airline pilots. <laughs> Once in a while, I need a neurosurgeon. <laughs> you know, one night, I should never forget this one. He was sitting on my left, very attractive, you know, and, and nervous dude, and he kept looking around, and he introduced himself. And he told me he was a retired lieutenant colonel in the United States Air Force. I was really impressed with him because he's about 24 years old. <laughs> and he kept some looking around and he said, actually, he said, uh, I'm a U-2 pilot, baby. Oh, and we're sipping on our 49 cent glass of wine and... <laughs> He said, yeah, he said, I fly secret missions all over the world. And he looked around. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, baby, last night I flew over Russia. I said, I know you did, because I was with you on that trip. You know, <laughs> you know, there's a little paragraph in the vision for you that says some of us thought, what sought sorted place of looking for understanding, companionship, and approval. And I'm always looking out there looking for love. And I don't know what would happen, you know, we'd always, all us geniuses sitting on, the, you know, looking in the mirror, probably feeling like that song about Eleanor Rigby and wondering where all those lonely people were coming from. And then by the, 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 the legal hour for, uh, for the bars to close in LA is 2 o'clock in the morning. And I don't know what would happen between those bars and that little sleazy dump of a place that I lived, but I would come to it again at that awful hour of the morning where they dumped me in the front yard, three and four and five o'clock, and, and it, all, it was always seemed so dark and it always seemed so cold, and it always seemed darkest right before dawn. And in California in April, they're called mysterious night birds, and they come out at like the stroke of 12. And there I am in a field position in the grass, and then they, he, I would listen to these birds and these tall palm trees. Dogs travel in packs in, 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 in that area where I lived. And uh, it was in the days when there were metal trash cans out on the sidewalk, and I could hear it would take several of these dogs uh, to tr push the can into the street, and I could still hear the zinging noise of the lid as it would crawl down the street. And I'm down there in that grass making deals with a God I didn't believe in. But it was the usual, my alcoholic prayer was, God, if you get me out of this one. And then I hear the dogs barking and screaming and fighting each other over the garbage. You know, it's all about survival when you live, you know, in that kind of environment. But in the face of my gorgeous little daughter, with the big brown eyes, the would come into my consciousness. And she'd say things to me like, Mom, you always promised me, you know, that you're going to come to PTA meeting, that you get drunk. All my friends' parents come. Why don't you ever come? And I'd look at her, and by this time I'm crying silent tears. I have no more tears left, and I have more, no more lies, you know, to tell her. There's a line in the, in, in, in the, in the doctor's opinion that we come to a place where we can't differentiate the difference between the truth and the false. And I'm living a lie, and I can't tell this little child, a little girl of mine, you know, that, that I'm going to come. And I would say to her things like, well, next time, next time. And, I, and I'm drinking around the clock, and I, had to, I would have to have a drink, you know, just to get out of the chair. But, you know, I'd say to her, next time you, there's a PTA meeting, please let me know. And, you know, I'm 28 years, and on Monday it'll be 28 years and five months sober, and I haven't been to a PTA meeting yet, you know. <laughs> because Dr. Silver says what happens is a phenomenon of craving would start. The moment my eyes were opened. And, um, and so there I was there in that ghetto, and... I'd have to get up out of, that, off, out of that grass and rush up the steps and charge down that hall and, you know, and, and, and get to that dirty bathroom and get on my knees in front of the toilet bowl. Do a few chin-ups. 
you know, chin sliding around trying to find a comfortable place to rest. And it seems to me sometimes that, that I was going to throw up my very soul and go and fall into a blackout again and head leaning against that cold porcelain. And I know, did you ever, you know, come out of a blackout and the room is spinning? And, you know, I used to try to slow down the spin by focusing on something. And the two words that always greeted me was American Standard. (laughs) (laughs) So I'd get up off the floor, get dressed to make the run, break the promise to the kids, not going down to the liquor store at 6 o'clock that morning. And... uh, you know, I'm 65 pounds overweight, and um, you don't get to buy gourmet food on food stamps, and uh, and and and, and you just eke out a few pennies from the from the welfare uh, funds, and 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 go down there and stand in front of the liquor store door, put on my tight jeans, put on a bad leather jacket, shove on my dog glasses, and put on you know my starfire earrings hanging down to my shoulders. And my mode of transportation by then was a pair of gold fuzzy house slippers. <laughs> Charge past the kids' room, don't want to wake them up, get to that front door, open it quietly, you know, sneak down, it was still dark outside, feel like a thief in the night. Pass three houses, get down on Western Avenue and lean on the door, wait for the man to come. And I'm so grateful to God, uh, my loving God, that uh, my parents, my loving parents, didn't see their baby daughter, you know, ending up in front of the liquor store at 6 o'clock in the morning. And here comes the dude and the big bad Lincoln. And I'd had all that, and it didn't save me. And uh, I'd walk inside and stand at at that counter and wait for him to put the change away. Something about clerks in getting in the ghetto at 6 o'clock in the morning when you're the only customer, they can be cruel. And uh, I'm standing there, you know, shaking, wetting myself sometimes, and I can feel it going down into my fuzzies, and, uh, and I'm trying to be cute. I hadn't been cute for a very long time. <laughs> I no way. And, and, um, and he leaned on it. He'd get it, you know, he put the bottle of wine in the paper bag, and he'd lean on it, and he play with the bag at the top and say things like, who's drinking all this wine, baby? Um, I said, listen, you, I have house guests. <laughs> I hadn't had a guest in my house in a long time. I had, and he said, you serve Ripple? Snatch it out of his hand and get out, pass a little plaque glass where to go around the side. Lean on, 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 on the building. You know, my days for fine drinking was over. I no longer drank out of Baccarat crystal glasses. And I didn't have to worry about, you know, bar openers and, and, you know, the faces of smiling, handsome men. I just opened up that and took a hit and it went down and I was going to make it for another hour get back to that house and sit in that chair and I listen to my kids fix their own breakfast and lunch and, and you know it wasn't long after that the grandparents had to take them away and I'm sitting in the chair and so watching the real dawn come up probably feeling like the man who said I had a dream last night that life was passing me by no longer in the dreams of life I'm dying physically, emotionally and spiritually dying in the chair I was uh, sitting there wondering, how did this all happen? And I would reflect on growing I grew up in Atlanta. I was born in Grady Hospital in Atlanta, Georgia. And my father was a full-blooded Cherokee Indian of the Cherokee Nation. Lived on a reservation until he was in his early 20s in North Carolina. And by, you know, I'm going to be speaking in North Carolina in, in about four or five weeks. And every time I get the chance to go over to the East Coast, I always visit that reservation. When I was a little girl, I used to remember my dad talking about it. I'm the youngest of seven children. My brothers and sisters of the, of the, of the seven were not and are not alcoholics. And I am the one I believe was born restless, irritable, and discontented. Right out of the chute, man. I could have had a little drinky poo. I could have had a little drinky poo in the first grade, you know. And... It would help me get to the second grade, and uh, 
because I had trouble in Georgia. I was always rebellious right from the beginning. And I can remember my poor <laughs> loving mother saying, Clara, why don't you behave and act like the other children? Well, I hated the other children, and I went, did not want to like them. <laughs> I was scared of them, so... You know, I remember standing by in my little seat. You know, they had those little, little, little seats for the, in, in school with the arm attached to the back. And, and, you know, I'd be standing there. I was terrified of people. And I don't know why. I never, but I, I grew up in a wonderful home, wonderful parents. And, and I, we had everything. My father was an artist and an entrepreneur. And we had all those outside things. And, and I just don't, I didn't know, think that I belonged to them, actually. I used to talk, they used to talk about the stalk. I used to think they dropped me off somewhere on the front porch because I was so different from the rest of them. And, and I would, uh, and I would just, you know, hang out alone in the woods and, 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 and I was just, I just was confused about life and terrified of, and as I said earlier about death. Um, my mother dragged me off to church a lot. I was really resentful about that, and I had a lot of trouble with God at a very early age. Um, but every time they cracked the door, I was the sinner on the front seat. I never could figure that one out. I had a lot of mixed messages growing up. And uh, so I remember when I was a senior at Booker T. Washington High School in Atlanta, I won an art scholarship that took me to the Boston Museum School of Fine Arts, and that's where I was educated. And uh, so I, I remember sitting on that segregated train and giving Atlanta the finger, and um, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm pouting, you know, <laughs> and and I'm looking out the window and I'm saying, I'll fix them, you know, I'll fix them, you know, and they didn't even know I was leaving town, you know. <laughs> I remember arriving in Boston, you know, and I was going to be a whole new thing. And here I grew up in Union Baptist Church, and, and I was never allowed to do all those things. My mother always told me it was the devil's work. You don't wear lipstick. You don't go to, you don't date. You don't do this, and you don't do that, and you don't take performing arts in school. That is, that's the devil's work. I never knew who the devil was, but I didn't, he was sure busy in my life. <laughs> I walk into that school, and I read the art calendar sometimes now, and some of the students, when I was a freshman, they're, they're, they're big in the art world in this country now, and, and I went in, and I was terrified of them. I looked around that room, I didn't belong there either. And you know, when I grew up in Georgia, it was a dry state, and I, I was sober before I learned that they, um, you know, they had bootleg liquor. I just didn't, I'd never seen alcohol. I didn't know it existed, and I'd never seen a person intoxicated, had no idea that there was alcohol around. And so I was started hanging out in the movies because I'm free at last. I can go, I'd never, I'm 19 years old, never been to a movie. So I go into the movies, and I started hanging out and watching people up on the screen live, and I thought, hey, that must be really exciting. I wonder how they do that. And I, and I, but I lo always loved jazz music, and uh, I can't, it doesn't mean that I, my fantasy was it, because I can't sing and I can't dance, and we don't all have rhythm. <laughs> <laughs> it's a myth. It's a myth. <laughs> it's a myth. Um, so I started hanging out in the movies and watching it. I couldn't believe it. And one night I'm walking down the street with a friend, uh, uh, another student, and she and I were walking out, and I hear this great jazz music come out of the door as these people walked out. And I said to her, just on a hunch, I said, let's go in there and see what they're doing. And we walk into this room, and it was dimly lit, and you're wrong with the cigarettes and the booze. And down at the end of the bar was this uh, rather portly lady, and she was singing the blues. And my heart started, that, that kind of feeling with that excitement. And that was something I'd always been looking for. And... Uh, and I, when we walk up to the bar, and I said to the bartender, what are you going to, he said, what are you going to have to drink? And I didn't know, but in the movies, they always talked about martinis. <laughs> and I was about to commit my first hip slick cold act, you know. <laughs> I leaned on the bar, and I looked at it, and I said, we'll have a martini, honey. I said, and make it dry. I had no idea what a dry martini <laughs> was. <laughs> <laughs> guy turns around, he puts these two lovely stem glasses up on the bar, and he even it out of this can, and, and it looked like lemonade. Well, you know how hot it is in this area of the country and, and down in Georgia. And I didn't know you sip drinks, because <laughs> it looked like lemonade. And, and my mom used to have pitchers of lemonade in the hot summertime, and 
I just looked around and I picked it up and I dumped it. Man, I was a pig from the gate. You know? <laughs> but I remember the way it made me feel. Dr. Silkworth says men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. I never had a date and I walk, I now have a permanent smile, an empty glass in my hand. I walk out on the dance floor and these couples were dancing and I looked around and I started looking. I got myself some new friends at night. You know, I call them colorful, but the big book calls them little companions. <laughs> I walk out there and I hooked up with the pimps, the hookers, the madams, and the bad boys. And I learned how to walk the walk and talk the talk. And I know about all about street life. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I, still, uh, my, I still love jazz music. It's on my, in my car all the time. And my favorite artist, uh, jazz artist today is Randy Crawford. And she sings a song that really fits the lyrics fit me. Because every time I listen to it, it's quite popular, even in commercials now. Uh, I'll paraphrase the words when it says, If you are young, don't get old in the streets. Cold's going to hit you in the back. You're going to nickel and dime your life away. There's a lot, thousand lives to play out there till you play your life away. And that was me. I started that game. I met this nice young man on a bar one night. He came from a lovely family in Boston. And, um, and he didn't know much about drinking, and we kind of learned together. And, we, and I, you know, I'm a real alcoholic. It was, took me years to get in trouble before I really crossed that line and you know I never threw up and I was you know I you know I never drank in the daytime until when I crossed that line it started getting where I always waited to what I call a respectable cocktail hour at six o'clock I would start to drink for years but then you know it got down to three o'clock in the afternoon and I had the long lunches and then it got to ten o'clock in the morning and then at five at six o'clock in the morning when I'm getting off the floor I said well it's five o'clock somewhere in the world you know <laughs> go on and drink and so we uh, we we started living that life and it was a marvelous time for me ever going to start drinking because I could walk into those jazz clubs and, you know, Bill Wilson just loved those clubs and we, we talk about it, we, we read about it in his story. And he talked about them chatting in the thousands and, you know, and, and now they chat in the billions. And, uh, and, we, and I just walked in there and I could walk in any club. I became very friendly with the late great legend Billie Holiday. So I started palling around with Billie Holiday, and then there was Louis Armstrong, and I can still see him, you know, in those clubs with, you know, the perspiration on that white handkerchief. And I started hanging out with um, with Dizzy Gillespie and, and Miles Davis, and I could go on down that line. And it was they were always J.J. Johnson, and if you're a jazz fan, you know the names that I'm calling. Some of you are young, you probably never heard of these people, but but it's part of my story. And um, so my husband and I really loved the life, and we loved the lifestyle. I know the difference between lifestyle, you know, and life today because I have the life of God's gift through the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, and it's a life that I live with, with the freedom that the book promises, and, and the promises certainly have come true in my life. Um, so I... Uh, was, we, I just we started hanging out, and we had a little son, and I pushed that little son off on the grandparents to raise him. You know, the, you know there's a part in the book that describes the kind of practicing alcoholic, you know, I was when it says selfishness and self-centeredness that we think is the root of our troubles. And it goes on in that paragraph to say we're driven people, and we're driven by hundred forms of fear. Self, self, what is it? Self, self-seeking, self, whatever, self-delusion, um, and self-pity, and that was me. And I could add to my list ad infinitum all, all of those, those, those fears that, that that haunted me all the time. So I'd have to go visit that little boy, you know, and they grow up and they look at you with that look, and he'd say, "But mom, you promised me the last time that you were here to visit that." Uh, you're going to take me to the park. And I say, yeah, but next time. You see, because I was too busy. I had to get back downtown in Boston and crawl up on the stools with the other geniuses and, and you know, and solve the problems of the world. And uh, that's the way it was. And, and, you know, and it just got worse. And in my, he traveled a lot in his family's company. And so I decided that, you know, I, I'm one of those that has a compulsive personality. One is not enough. 
and I need some more excitement. I'm still on that search for something that's going to fill me up on the inside instead of all the outside stuff. And so I'm sitting there, and this is the truth, I'm sitting there on a stool, and Billy Holiday's sitting there, and we're talking. And this man walked in, and I'd have been looking. I knew there was a man out there somewhere. And uh, he was going to um, uh, fill my life and take full responsibility for it. He walked up, and I'll describe him. He had a black hat turned around, all, all down, all the way around. He had a top coat over his shoulders. This dude was so cool, he couldn't put his arms through the sleeves, you know. <laughs> And he walked up there, and he reached in, he leaned over, and he reached in his pocket. He puts his ten $100 bills on the top of the bar, and he spread it like a deck of cards, and he leaned over and whispered, spend it. Well, I knew that God, and I didn't believe in it, answered my prayer on that one. So, I, <laughs> And he turned out to be the head of the mafia of the Boston family. And I learned what it was to run with the mob for a few years. Bodyguards, limousines, and... You guys who like classic cars, it was an old Mercedes with the, with the square trunk and white, wide white wall tires. And, and they always had the, the guns on the floor and, and the husband's out of town and I'm just living it up. And I'm a party girl and, and I'm living the dangerous life. And, and, you know, it just seems to me we just go over to New York for, for a drink and we, we go and hang in Harlem and, and, you know, and see all the great, you know, all the great stars of the time that were, you know, performing in Harlem. It was exciting, but there was always that, like, that emptiness inside. I couldn't fill it up. Tried so hard, you know, and, and it got worse. And then one, one beautiful Sunday morning, my loving God that I've come to believe in would seem to me to try to get my attention. And uh, it was a, I looked, it was an English, it was a, a New England church, a beautiful church. And um, these young families were all about to cross the street, apparently going into that church. And I'm sitting in the back of the limousines with, the, with Blackie and that memorial, the bodyguards. And, and Mr. Wonderful is hung over, and we've just spent all that money. We've been over to the opening of the great jazz club called Birdland in New York. And, and uh, Billy Eckstein had been the opening star, and we'd gone over there just to see that. And uh, it was like a voice said to me, Clara, something's wrong with your life. And I agreed. The problem was Boston. <laughs> 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 and uh, he came home. The husband came home, and I said, we're going to L.A. And I remember we just closed up that house. My son's 10 years old. I'd stop visiting him because I can't stand the guilt, and I can't stand that look. And so I put him in the back of the car, and we drove out straight out Route 66, you know, right in L.A. And I went with good intentions. I always went with good intentions until I took the drink. And all the good intentions went out of the window, and I crawled up, crawled up on the first bar stool in, the, uh, in L.A., and we started, started the run all over again. Then we had those two kids, and we went into the small business. And, you know, it get come the time we stopped hanging in the clubs, and now we're having the wild parties, and... You know, any excuse to drink, and I, my house was always filled with, with people, and we were drinking, and it was young. And I remember that I used to sit in that club, and Billy Holiday used to you know, sing a song. But when the spending in and the money is gone, they don't come around no more. And when I'm standing out in front of that liquor store door, you know, in the cold mornings, not one of them ever showed up and said, How, was you, how are you, Clara, this morning, and what are you going to do about your life today? And I, you know, I walk into my first meeting of Alcoholics and Moms. I got my sponsor that night, and she looked in my eyes, and she asked me one question. Do you want to stay sober today? And that was the beginning of this journey. Um, so I, so I, I, I just started, uh, you know, the, losing it all, like I explained earlier. And now I'm sitting in there, and the, the parents, the grandparents have taken away uh, those two younger kids, I've lost all contact with the older son who left. And, um, and I'm just, you know, I'm out in, in, in blackouts now, waking up in places, in places like a County General Hospital in downtown Los Angeles, which is not one of your favorite HMOs. <laughs> and nervous interns, you know, patching me up uh, while being beaten up in the streets by strangers you know, out of those bars under the influence of, of, of alcohol. And then one morning came that came the one that was the rocker. It was on another Sunday morning, and uh, 
I was at, right in front of, you know, the Forum, which is a place where the, then the, the late, L.A. Lakers used to play basketball. And I'm on Crenshaw, and I'm in a blackout, and it was, a, it was a, like early Sunday morning. And my head is against the curb, and it was a cowboy, a, a cowboy boot with a leg attached to it. And I, and I knew it was cowboy boots because it had a, it had a metal cleat at the toe. And he's kicking me in the head. And I remember going in and out of consciousness. And I would come out again, and then I could hear my ribs just being kicked in one at a time. See, I know about pain. I know about emotional pain, and I know about physical pain, and the pain has no memory. I'm living the life of the, of the Jay Walker, of what total insanity is so beautifully described in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I am hanging out with insane friends and doing insane things and always expecting, or, and always expecting a different results. And there I am, you know, in that street, and I'm screaming, and when I come to again, I'm in Daniel Freeman Hospital, which is a little, little area outside of the ghetto. And the paramedics, people who are dedicated in saving your life, hey, when you don't want your life saved. How many times did I sit in that overstuffed chair contemplating suicide only to learn that suicide is a final solution to temporary problems? And I'm sitting in there, you know, on that, uh, uh, in that, on that gurney, and they, 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 they push me down and they strap me down and they've got tubes hooked up to me and they're pumping me back to life. And two nuns were standing at the side of the bed. And then we talk about the moment of clarity. And um, the police with the foot of the bed. And the older nun wasn't thrilled with me at all. <laughs> She's leaning over me with these horn-rimmed glasses, and she had on a black habit, and she had her hands through the sleeves, and she's leaning over me, and she's pointing to the, and then she took her hand, and she pointed to the police, and she said, you tell them. And she doesn't know that, you know, I don't know until this day as I stand here, and I don't know who did that, but, but I didn't want her to know that I didn't know, and, uh, and I told her to buzz off, and I told the police to buzz off. And she walked to the door, and she stood there, and she looked back, and she shook her head sadly, and threw her head up like that, and she walked away. But the young nun stood there, probably in her early 20s, with a white habit on, and all I could see was this part of her eye, face, and her eyes were as blue as the heavens. And this young nun started to cry, and her tears fell on the covering of the bed, and she had a, 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 some gauze and a solution, and she was wiping the blood out because I had a brain concussion. And she was wiping the blood out of the corner of my eyes, and I had a broken nose. And, and she leaned over me and quietly said, how did you ever let your life get into such a state? And I looked up at her, and I, I, I know. Never occurred to me, not once. You talk about the self, second step and the insanity of our disease. I just couldn't figure it out, and I didn't say anything. And, you know, in those days, the way they treated alcoholics, they just picked us off, up off the streets, and, and they would take us into the hospitals, and they would just treat you, hold you for 72 hours. It was not about the treatment of alcoholism. It was just a treatment for whatever, whatever your injury was. And those interns used to take uh, how they treated my injury was they put the gauze around your, your, your chest, they took two and a half inch wide adhesive tape and they walked around and they pulled it together to pull the ribs back in place which left you standing over, bending over. And, and that third day uh, I was there, that same young nun, for some reason uh, all those nuns was assigned to dress me. And I shall never remember, forget how she came down that, day, uh, that morning and she uh, put, you know, put her arms around me and <clears throat> I had my leather jacket over because I couldn't get my arms through the sleeves. And, and you should have seen her trying to figure out where the bangs went on the, on the wig, you know. <laughs> and uh, and she, then she patted me and she told me I looked wonderful. And, and I had on my house slippers and I, we went to the front door of Daniel Freeman Hospital, the spiritual being that she is. And I've come to believe that we're all born spiritual be beings and it's our humanness in the road that we walk that we try to find. She stood there with her arms around me and she said, try not to drink today. And I'm in such pain I can hardly walk, but I went to the first liquor store. 
That's what I did. I went to the first liquor store and standing there, this pitiful being, you know, we, you know, alcoholism, you know, has no gender. But I know the price of an alcoholic woman and the price I paid. And I stumbled into the first liquor store and I bought a bottle of Ripple. And the man looked at me and he just handed it to me like I was scum. And I went on back down to a few blocks away where I lived and uh, I walked there. It was painful. And I don't know what happened on, on April the 9th, 1974. I came out of that blackout that morning on a dirty floor. The stench was unbelievable. I lost the will to care. And I just bolted off that floor, screaming, I cannot live like this again. I can't keep living like this. God, please help me. I've come to believe in the power of prayer. It was that simple. You know, what I've learned in Alcoholics Anonymous is that Alcoholics Anonymous is a simple program for complicated people. I got up off that floor, just screamed, it was dark. Thank God that there were no strangers in my house that morning because the men in my life by this time had faces, no names. And often it was for the price of a drink. Um... I called my best friend, who was not an alcoholic, and she told me about Alcoholics Anonymous. She said, I don't know what they do, but they help each other stay sober. And little, she's still my friend. We went out to dinner last week. She said, little do they know, uh, little did she know that, that, um, that that's what we do through God's grace and the program of alcoholics and all. We help each other stay sober to achieve the freedom that we are guaranteed in the promises. And, and I said, do they have a phone? Because I'd never heard of alcoholics. And I, was, I didn't know there was a place that I could, you could go to get sober. So uh, <clears throat> and she said, well, I'll call them. And I picked up the phone, and I called the operator, and I asked, was such a place called Alcoholics Anonymous? And she said, yes, honey. She said, there is, and I'll put you right through to them. And it was central office. And a man said, um, good morning, this is Alcoholics Anonymous. May I help you? I said, yeah, man. I said, my name is Claire and I can't stop drinking. And the truth was finally out. And that's what I've learned through the steps is that the truth will set you free. I felt relieved that I had finally admitted in my innermost self that I could not drink or I was going to die. So he said, well, dear, he said, just don't drink together today. And I said, hey, you know, wait a minute. <laughs> Yeah, wait a minute. I said, you know, at all? <laughs> and he said, no, we don't drink an alcohol to the, uh, anonymous. He said, one day at a time, just don't drink today. He said, you can do it. And uh, he told me about the meetings, and I told you my story, and I, I say to him, <clears throat> do you have meetings in Beverly Hills? <laughs> He said, yes, we do, honey, but you go into the meeting in your neighborhood. I said, I can do that. I can do that. <laughs> so I had, you know, my big Cadillac had long been gone, and I'd been down there for a couple of years, and, and uh, I called my brother who worked for Delta Airlines at LAX, and I called him. I said, Ike, I think I found a place for me, and it's called Alcoholics Anonymous. And the man on the phone told me they're going to help me stop drinking. And I said, but I need a car to go to the meeting. And he worked the night shift, and he said, well, I'll be right over. When I get off, he said, when I get off, he said, I'll, you know, I'll bring the car by, and you, you can keep it. So I can remember standing by the door, and I could hear him running up the stairs. And I was standing there, and he, he, he embraced me, and he kissed me, and he said, I hope this is going to work for you. He said, it pains us to watch you live the way you live. He said, it's going to hurt us more if we see you die. And he said, you keep the car. I started to get dressed that morning for my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I hope I never had that experience again. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know what you guys were about. And uh, I didn't know about detox, and I didn't know the language. What I learned is the language, indeed, is the language of the heart. And, uh, and it was around 10 o'clock in the morning. I'm just pacing around, and I open the closet door on what to wear. And I got one red dress, and I'm looking at it for a half hour trying to make a decision. (laughs) (laughs) 
I got it out and got some soap and water and a brush. I cleaned it up, and, you know, and I put that head farm on the, one of those, that, that wig on one of those head farms, you know, and I brushed it out and cut some better bangs. And <laughs> I, I sprayed her up. She looked wonderful. <laughs> so I did around 10, 11, 12 o'clock, around 1 o'clock. I don't know what's happening to me. I'm jerking around, and my muscles feel like scratching, and I don't know what's happening to me. And, and I decided just to get it out of the house because I want to say to you newcomers, you know, this is a program of hope because on that phone from a stranger that morning, I found hope. He said, just don't drink today. <coughs> so I was determined not to go to the liquor store. So around <laughs> 1 o'clock, I put on my jacket, and I go over to Woolworths. They burned it down in the last riot. But <laughs> 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 I went over to that Woolworths, and uh, I'm just browsing around and just going from counter to counter. And so I stole some eyelashes for my first meeting of alcohol tonight. <laughs> They come quite, you know, they come quite long. I didn't know you were supposed to trim them down the size. <laughs> and so it was an 8 o'clock meeting, 7 o'clock, you know, I'm standing in front of the meeting in, in the mirror, and, uh, you know, the perspiration is coming from under the wig. I'm shaking like a motor. I am just, you know, bouncing. So those eyelashes come with a little tube of glue. So, that, you know, I'm trying to get the glue along the edge of the lash, you know, and, and, I, and I pause for an opportune moment. And then I slam them in. <laughs> One end was up here and the other end's down here. And I lean, I'm too tired to start all over. I lean in the mirror. I say, you are looking good. <laughs> and I went off to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I remember walking in that, that meeting that night and, and you know, Tall Scotty was, uh, was, a, was a greeter. And he's about, got about 39 years now and and he walked in, he said, get yourself a cup of coffee. And in those days, they had real cups in all, all the meetings. And, and I went and, and, I, and I filled it too full, and I didn't want to, them to see me shaking, so I left it on the table. And I went back in the first row in the seat by the aisle, and I sat on my hands. And we detoxed in meetings when I got sober in those days. We'd, and then the old times would come running at us when we'd go into convulsions with, with a little jar of honey and some lemon and a spoon. And they'd shove it in our mouths, and we'd calm us down. And, and um, I'm sitting there on my hands, you know, and it was like they talk about the drowning person. And my whole life flashed before me. And it was like, you know, uh, what I saw was um, alcohol had stripped me of all human dignity. It stripped me of all moral values, all those wonderful Christian values, and my wonderful parents, and tried to show me as when I was growing up. And I sat there, and they started the meeting, and the, and, and the late Gail Wilson was the speaker that night. She walked to that podium, and she talked about loneliness, and she talked about fear, and she talked about death, things I'd never heard on those bar stools. And she talked about being an airline a stewardess at the time. They called them stewardess, and being in Paris. And she was from Kentucky, and she talked about calling her mother in Kentucky and saying, I'm so lonely. And her mother said, how can you be lonely in Paris? She said, I'm lonely wherever I go. And I said, yes. I knew. I knew I was in the right place. Because she was talking the language that I had never heard. And at the coffee, and they, when they started the meeting, they asked for the hands of the newcomer. And I didn't know what a newcomer was. And the lady behind me touched me on my shoulder and she said, you're a newcomer, honey. Raise your hands. <laughs> and at the coffee break, I went up there, and this young lady came to me with a, with a little piece of paper, and the name was Carol, and a telephone number on it. And she said, um, my name is Carol, and I'm going to be your sponsor. And she looked in my eyes, and this most incredible thing happened, because when I looked in her eyes, I had wine sores in my face, open wine sores, and I had fluid on my joints, and I could hardly walk by then. And and she put her arms around me and kissed me. And she said, we love you. And I could look at her eyes. It was like looking into her soul. And I knew she loved me. She didn't ask me my last name. She didn't ask me where I'd gone to school. She didn't ask me how much money. She said, do you want to stay sober? And I said, yes. She said, go home and call me. And I'll tell you what Alcoholics Anonymous is about. 
And I went home and and I called and she went to Priam over the phone. And we started this incredible journey. And we got into the books. And I in that in the nineteen seventy four there were about twenty of us newcomers and we got into service right away. We were we were t- we were told to get into service that you know because it kept us actively um, involved in others instead of in ourselves, and, and it was just you know it was it was wonderful. And and uh, and she that out of the 25 have died of uh, natural causes, and the other 15 of the other 15 of us are still sober. Not one of us ever went out. Not one of us. Some of you may have heard Sean A. He's, he's out of Canada. I guess so with Sean. And we get the privilege to, to be messengers. The message is in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. We are just the messengers. And I have, I'm come to believe that God speaks to us through others. And, and, uh, and he, I have two weeks more than he does, and I will not let him forget that. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, we got busy. Uh, I was unemployable. I would never really worked. And I remember when I was six months sober, you know, I physically had so many problems. I, the sores had healed, and, and, I, and I was doing better, but I stayed on food stamps and welfare because there was nothing else I could, you know, there was no other way to, to earn any money. So when I was six months sober, my sponsor said, I think it's time that you can get a job. And I said, well, I don't know how to work. She said, well, I listen, the mafia does not take care of you nowadays, dear. Uh, we are self-supporting through our own contribution. You get a job. <laughs> and uh, so I got my first job as a waitress. I was a terrible waitress. And um, I spill a lot of coffee on people. And, you know, I used to whine my first two years in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I, <laughs> and I remember being at a meeting one night in the... And the uh, older gentleman in the back of the, of the group, and we, it said, after we said the amen, came up, put his arms around me. He said, Clara, please, come down off the cross. Um, <laughs> he said, honey, we need the wood. <laughs> <laughs> He's passed on now. But anyway, I stopped the whining, and things got better, and I started the steps, and uh, I made amends to my two uh, younger kids. And it was very painful to go in the room and sit down with them after I did that fourth step and, and, she, and tell them, you know, that I, I, I was never a bad mother, and I was, but I was a sick person and that they would never have to live like that again. And I was a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And they were kind of young, and they didn't really understand. And, and uh, at the end of that year, um, that first year, my sponsor, I'm a double winner because my sponsor sent me to al to learn to deal with the family after that's in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and it worked for me, and it still works for me. Uh, that older son came back into my life, um, I guess when I was about three or four years sober, and he'd gone off and he be- had become very involved in the movie industry, and he'd become quite successful and, uh, in television, and um, he was doing quite well, and he was working for ABC Television in New York at the time, and um, he came home. And he was the one that I had the most pain, you know, that I, because he was older than the other two, and he saw a lot more. Um, I remember going into the room with him and saying the same thing. Is, is it, it advises us to do in the, in, the, in the steps. And I made my amends to him, and I said to him, you know, the same thing as I said to, my, to the two younger ones. I remember he was a wonderful, handsome young man, and he looked at me and he said, well, Mother, that was yesterday, and we're not promised tomorrow. He said, why don't we as a family start today and start the healing? And I've come to understand that God in time does help help with the healing. Uh, And he went back to New York, and he was there working for a while. Uh, The promises started to come true. Uh, When I was uh, five years sober, uh, my daughter, the little daughter, I couldn't go to her um, PTA meeting, and the parents, grandparents had done the, you know, the, paid for this wonderful training, became the first black professional skater with, in the ice capades with Dorothy Hamill. Wow. Yeah, and the promises started to come through. <laughs> when I was seven years sober, Ken was, uh, I guess, about 17 or 17, 18 by that time, and he got into alcohol and drugs, and, you know, when I was out there, you know, running around with the mafia, I was around drugs all the time. I never, you know, touched drugs. Alcohol 
was my lover. My it was every, it, it was ecstasy. I loved alcohol, and I looked at this other stuff. And and when I was out there, you know, the big drug then was opium, and I can remember just riding with the ma- uh, mafia into New York and dump, dropping off the opium to the opium dens. And, and now my son is in, uh, into um, uh, cocaine and shooting cocaine. And if I'm, any of you know about Studio 54, and uh, he, was a, he was working at ABC Television in the news department with the news anchors who are still there now. And uh, he was working as their assistant at the time, and he was hanging out at Studio 54, and that's how it all started. And we didn't know anything about, out, about, about cocaine out on the streets in those days. It, it was out there, and they had no idea of the effects of it. And he, here he was shooting in cocaine and sharing the needles with everybody in the Studio 54. It was, the, it was the click of the time. Drugs was his, and alcohol was mine. And it was all about celebrities with him, and the same with me. And, and, uh, and then, you know, he got, he, when his contract was over, he moved back to Los Angeles, got married and had a little son. And I have a little grandson, and his name is Aaron, and he's now 15. And I remember, you know, when, when he was young, I'd made these promises. And, and, you know, as far as in the program, and I had, that I would keep my word, and I became responsible. And whenever he wanted, when he was little, and he'd say, Grandma, you know, um, you know, can we go to the park? I'd drop everything, you know, because I'd started that business. I drank away and when I was three or four years sober, and I, I, that's what I do now. I have a, my company now for 24 years, and I have a major company in the property and management. And what I do is I have a service to the home of the, of the rich and the famous. I do the homes of the movie stars, and, and I'm in the, you know, all of the major movie stars, and I have contracts to... And I had to have crews of people that work for me doing that, and and so I was I was uh, with him with, with, when when he when when he was my that son was uh, uh, Ken was uh, uh, having so much trouble, and he he got into drugs too, and he was starting to shoot cocaine, and uh, at that time, and he came to Alcoholics Anonymous, and uh, he was around for about ten years. And the other son, you know, with the marriage didn't last. Um, he moved up to San Francisco and was teaching um, theater arts at the college level. And uh, one day he called me in, in, in the late 80s. And, and he said, Mom, I don't, know what I'm, you know, I don't know what happened. He said, but I went to the doctor today, and, and they, I got tested, and they tell me I'm HIV positive. Took my breath away just like it was. And I remember holding that phone and taking it away and saying, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, and the courage to change the things I can, the wisdom to know the difference. And I had made that peace with him and that closure long. We'd become very good friends. I sponsored a young woman named Rita who died of AIDS. At, uh, I guess she was eight years sober. And I remember going down to Hermosa Beach, one of the beach towns, and one Sunday morning, and I looked at Rita and I said, Rita, how do you feel about death? My number one fear. And she looked at me quietly and she said, well, death is not the greatest loss in life. The greatest loss is dying inside while you're still alive. And I remember sitting in the back of limousines dying and, you know, in those wild parties and hanging out with the important people of the show business world and dying inside. And, I shared that with my son, and he said, well, you know, I feel okay now, Mom. He said, but when it, when it comes time that I can't take care of myself, they had no medication at that time. He said, when it comes that I can't take care of myself, he said, I'll come home. I'll call you. And he did. Nineteen months later, he called me, Mom, uh, I can't take care of myself, and I'm coming home to die. And that's a little son I couldn't take to the park. But because of this program and loving God, you know, I had a place for him to come home. And he came, and I've been, I, I'm in, 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 uh, very active in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I still have, you know, pals to prisons. I do, you know, I, I share my story a lot all over the country, and, um, and I sponsor a lot of women, and I'm very active. I'm the board of directors of, of, uh, of Women in Recovery Home, and, and but what I did is I put it all aside and I 
I spent hours with that son. And if you haven't, you know, if you haven't done those steps, I want to say to you, life is brief. It's very fragile. You do it now. We don't have tomorrow. I remember hours sitting there with that son and watching him go from 175 pounds to 99 pounds. And the, and, and the loving members of Alcoholics Anonymous and newcomers, you never have to do anything alone. You know, Steve talked about Alabama Carruthers last night and Marie, and they were there. They were the ones. And, and then, you know, it came that time when, he, when the, we, there was absolutely no hope. My son had done a lot of work for the Grateful Dead, and... Um, one of them had sent uh, flowers and some lyrics, and they put it to music for all of us around that bed to sing because that was my son's request because by that time, he couldn't talk. He just wrote. And, you know, I said, take straw and dip it in the water and put it on his lips. And, and we all sang that morning, my sponsor at the foot of the bed, his bed. At 10 o'clock in the morning, that rasping sound of death, and then it was quiet. He was gone. And I pray that all of their souls and loved ones and mine and yours, you know, souls rode the wings of angels, higher place, no more crying, no more dying, and no more pain. And life goes on, and there was a legal pad at the, at the, ta- at the, at the, at the headboard, and I picked it up. I, don't, my heart, I thought my heart would explode with pain. And I wrote God a letter, not a note. Dear God, thank you for having used me as a channel to bring your child into this universe. Forgive me if I harmed him in any way. He's in a better place. He's with you. And I still have it. I got to tell you, you know, life goes on. And, you know, and we, you know, you know, what I've learned in Alcoholics Anonymous is where there's a step, you do the step. Where there's an action, you take the action. And I would like to stay, to say, stand here and tell you, you know, that, that, that life is beautiful, and it is. What I've learned from my sponsor, you know, it isn't, it isn't what happens to me in life. It's my attitude about it. And uh, that other son, you know, after 10 or 12 years in Alcoholics Anonymous, stopped going to meetings. And he got well, and it isn't, it is not safe to get well in Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> and um, August of last year, he started doing drugs again. And uh, he attempted suicide. And uh, he was burned, almost burned up in his, in his apartment, and uh, on and on. And we ended up in Cedar Sinai Hospital. And he's in a treatment center now. And he has full-blown AIDS. And what are the odds of that? You know, what are the odds of that? Uh, I have talked to him on, when did I come here? Uh, Thursday. Uh, I talked to him on Monday. He will be getting out uh, in another week. And he's done so much. Uh, he's he's took right to the program. And here's a, here's a young man who's always been privileged and, and he's been, since he's been in the treatments, and I guess we got for a sponsor, an ex-con who, uh, <laughs> who's sober eight years. He's got a missing tooth, and he tells him, sit down, and he sits down, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, you know. And uh, he's, he's ordering him around, and he's done so well there that they've asked him to come back on the staff as starting in two weeks. And they're setting up a program in that, in, in that treatment center for him to deal with, to work with alcoholics and, and um, drug addicts who have AIDS. My son called me. He said, I finally found a place for me. How it works. How it works. <laughs> you know. Life is wonderful. I cannot tell you how pleased I am that you allowed me to come and share my experience, strength, and hope with you and be a part of your weekend. I always close by saying, you know, we do the steps, we live by the traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous, and the promises do come true, but we do the work, and we do it in God's grace. 
And I've come to believe in that power greater than myself, which is really a miracle, and I've come to believe in miracles because they're real. And I leave my, and I see miracles sitting out here, and I saw miracles taking the chips tonight. And God bless you. Good night. Thank you.